We welcome everyone to New Hope today and those who may be in the parking lot or if you're joining us online. A special welcome to fathers today as you play an important role in the life of your family. A father was God's idea of representing himself to your family. That is a pretty important role that comes with responsibility. We have lots of special things for the fathers today. We want to honor you, and we've already had someone taste testing the treat, so they <laughs> must be all right. Yesterday, Pastor and I traveled to Rabbi Holbrook's church in Mansfield to give the message so Rabbi William could take a vacation. Rabbi William has been to our church, but if you are new here, you have probably not met him yet. But he comes periodically, so you will meet him eventually. This morning, we will be leaving, or not this morning, tomorrow morning, we will be leaving for the mission trip. Are, if you're new this morning, every year we go to a Christian Kentucky mission and do a project to help. And this year we are building a ramp for the head of the Living Waters mission so she can provide a place for pastors to come and rest but we go and work. <laughs> Your giving provided for the cost of the lumber for the ramp, so we do thank you for that. Those going on the trip are listed in your handout, and next week we hope to have some pictures for you to give you an idea of what the mission and the work is all about. So next we're gonna show a little short video just to show you that things on the church property are pretty quiet, except for Pastor Ron getting on his tractor and starting to dig out the parking lot. <laughs> so he is working away and going to provide a parking lot for all of us. So there he is working. We are scheduled for the sharing kitchen June 28th, the 30th, and the July 2nd. I noticed that we could use some workers on Wednesday of that week, so if you're available on Wednesday, that would be great, and you can sign up at the information table. Well, today's Father's Day and time when we talk about fathers. I went, as I shared with at Williams Church last night, or yesterday morning, Saturday, it wasn't Father's Day, so I didn't talk about fathers with them. I don't know. They miss Father's Day over there, I guess. But uh, today we're going to talk about fathers. You know, I believe in our country and, and where we're at right now, we have some real issues. I checked a few statistics. 18.3 million children live without a father in their home in our country. 18.3 million children don't have a father in their home. 70% of the boys being raised in church will abandon their faith in their teens and their 20s. Fatherless children are five times more likely to live in poverty. I believe there's somewhat of a crisis. I believe... Um, I believe we've done things, actually, I think we can blame ourselves, and I'm not going to go into that, but I personally believe we can blame ourselves for a lack of fathers. I believe there was decisions made that uh, made it advantageous not to have fathers in the home. And I believe that was wrong. And so, consequently, if we have 18.3 million children who don't have a father in the home, that means they have no idea what it means to have a father. What does it mean? Children are growing up without fathers. Children are growing up without that guidance. Mothers can do their part, but mothers aren't fathers. Mothers are mothers, and fathers are fathers. And God knew we needed fathers and mothers. And so that's how he made it. And so now we're in a situation where we have a lack of fathers. It's important to remember that God, the Bible says, God is a father to the fatherless. So God has a desire to be a father to all these children who don't have fathers. I believe he does that on his own. I believe you can seek him on your own. But I also believe that God sends people to be fathers to the fatherless. And I think that's where the church comes in. I believe there's a tremendous need, tremendous need for fathers, for children. 
over the years as we've picked up children and, and brought them to church, one of the things I noticed is it seems to me children have a craving for a fatherly example. They'll tend to gravitate towards just wanting to be around men. That they don't have it. And, and, and a godly man is attractive to them. And they, they want that. They want that. So how do we have this situation where all these children don't have fathers and then we're going to expect all these young men to be fathers? What's their example? Well, they, you know, they don't have an example. You know, they're, they're being raised without a father example. And that's where I believe that as a church, we become an example. Plus, I believe we need to encourage them to look to the Lord. That he's the true father. He says he'll be a father to the fatherless. And so they need to trust him and look to him. He's a good, good father. He's a good, good father. And so we need to know who he is. I believe he's the example for us. He's the example for us. What's it mean to be a father? You know, as Chad said, you know, you have your first child and you kind of go, oh, I'm a father. Now what do I do? You know, it's kind of like, oh my goodness, I'm a father. Well, I believe God stands as an example to us. And so today I want to look at the example that he is and hopefully that can encourage us to follow his example. Now, it can do a couple of things. It might discourage you because you go, oh, I can never live up to that. No, you won't because you're not God. But he is still our example. He's still the one that we can look to. You know, you need some kind of a standard. You need something to look to. Like, how do you decide what a good father is? You know, is a good father just somebody that gives me everything I want? You know, there's a point in children's lives when they think that's a good father. One of the things I've watched over the years is children, especially those going through divorces, children going through a divorce, they will say the good parent is one that get, lets me get away with everything. So if you're the strict parent that holds to rules and regulations, don't be surprised when your children don't want to live with you. Don't give up your standard. Don't give up being who God's called you to be. Eventually, they will see the importance of that. So don't, don't give up. Say, whoa, I better cave in because, you know, I want them to like me. You know, there's probably a point in life when your children don't have to like you. That that's not even an issue. And they may not like you. I don't know if you've ever heard your children say, I don't like you. That's okay, I love you, and I'm doing this because I love you. You know, you don't have to like me. So let's look at God, our Father. Let's see some examples. In Romans, the 8th chapter, the 14th verse. It says, For as many are as led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you do not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. We are heirs. God wants to guide us. We are led by the Spirit of God. God wants to lead us. Fathers are meant to lead. That's just, just that's the way they're made. They're meant to lead. But we need to lead by the Spirit of God. How does God do that? He does it by his Spirit. He speaks to us. God leads us. He doesn't drive us. There's a difference. There's a difference. The example to me is, is like a shepherd leading his sheep. A shepherd leading his sheep. He talks to them. They know his voice. They follow him. He leads. He's not behind them with a stick driving them, making them go this way or that way, but he leads by example. He says, this is, this is how we ought to do it. This is what we ought to do. And I believe in the same way fathers lead by example. Good or bad. You lead by example. Your example is what your children will follow. And good or bad, you know, we're not perfect. We're not perfect. The best thing you can do when you make a mistake is tell your children, I'm sorry, I messed up. 
That's a good example. That's leading them. That's leading them. But it's important, you know, don't tell your children this is what you ought to do. Show them. Show them this is how you ought to live. This is how you ought to be. This is how you ought to should talk. This is how you treat other people. We lead by example, and they follow. They follow that example. And then we know that God is a provider. He provides for us. In Matthew, the sixth chapter, the 31st verse. Therefore, don't worry, saying, well, what are we going to eat, or what are we going to drink, or what are we going to wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father, he knows you need all these things. He knows you need all these things. So God knows what we need, and he provides for us. He provides for us. We don't have to worry. We don't have to worry. He provides what we need. Now, I don't think God's going to spoil us. I don't think God's intent is to spoil us. I think his intent is to provide for us. You know, we spoil children by giving them whatever they want. I just want to tell you, you will spoil them. And we say we spoil them. You will spoil them. You will spoil them. One of the worst things you can do is give your children everything they want. It's one of the worst things you can do. Because they will grow up thinking they deserve everything they want. And they will demand that of everybody around them. Everybody around them. Life, life owes them. It's just, just everybody owes me because I get what I want. You can't tell me no. You know, what do you mean no? I get whatever I want. If I don't get it, you're going to pay. You're going to pay. Children have ways of making you miserable. Or at least trying. They'll try to make you miserable if you don't give them everything they want. But God our Father, He provides what we need. He provides what we need. And so we need to provide for our children. But we don't have to give them everything they want. Do you know my personal opinion? We're born pretty selfish. You know? Just look at babies. How selfish is a baby? Well, a baby is born and they demand what they want. When they want something, what do they do? They start crying. You know, they don't know anything. They have no other way of communicating. So they go, I'm hungry. My diaper needs changed. Help me, help me. Get to do this, do that, do this, do that. You know, when a baby cries, you know, mothers, especially new mothers, they jump. Oh, what's wrong? What's wrong? Well, I've tried everything. I fed them. You know, I changed their diaper. They're still crying. I don't know what to do. And sometimes there's nothing to do. You know, sometimes there's nothing to do. You don't know. But you know, that's what babies tend to do. They cry until they get attention. And I'm not saying you shouldn't give them attention. I think babies need lots of attention. Don't get me wrong. But I want to tell you something. As they grow up, they need to learn. And they need to learn that just because they cry doesn't mean they get something. Because that's what they'll do the rest of their life. When they don't get what they want, they will cry, and you better run. And if somebody doesn't run, you will pay. I believe God wants to protect us. I believe he wants to protect us. In John, the 10th chapter, the 29th verse. He says, Jesus says, he says, that My Father who has given these to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. He says, you know, those that follow me, they belong to me, and I'll, I'll take care of them. I'll protect them. I'll protect them. I'll watch over them. God watches over us as we follow him. I'm not 100, you know, here's something I always wonder about, and I, I'm not 100% sure, but if you don't follow him and you go your own way, is he still obligated to protect me? And sometimes, yes, but I think sometimes it's like, you know what? If that's the way you want to go, you're kind of on your own. And, and I, I just think going my own way just isn't a wise thing to do. I believe sometimes God will still protect me out of his mercy. But I believe he normally wants to protect us because we follow him. We stay close to him. 
You know, the Bible talks about him being like a mother hen who gets her chicks underneath her wings. You know, protects them. Protects them. I believe fathers protect their children. We have a, a, we have a series on a marriage that we've listened to and shared with some couples getting married. And, and in this series, this uh, teacher, he shares about how it's just in men to protect. He said, it's just, he says, you know, he says, if something happens in a building, he says, the men will jump up and start trying to protect the, men, the women and the children. He says, just how they are. He says, just in them. He says, you don't have to tell them. He says, they want to protect. He says, when they go to battle, if something happens, he says, they're the ones willing to jump in front of a bullet to save somebody. It's just, it's just a man's nature. Maybe some more than others, but, you know, it's in the nature to protect because I believe that's what fathers do. Fathers protect. God, our Father, protects us, and so we watch over and protect our children. Now, you can protect them, but there's a point where you've got to let them go. Okay? You know? And so that's a kind of a fine line sometimes. You know, you want to protect them, but then at some point you go, oh, you know what? They're growing up. They need to... They need to go out on their own. And I can't, I can't always protect them like I used to. When they're small, we protect them a lot. As they grow, they start to express themselves and make their own decisions. And our protection is a little limited and not like it was when they were small. But I think that's rightly so. And I believe God loves us. God loves us. In uh, 1 John... The third chapter, the first verse. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because, we, because it did not know him. We are the children of God. God my Father. God is my Father. Heavenly Father. Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this, our Father. And he loves us. He loves us. He cares for us. He has our best interest at heart. I can trust him. I can trust him. He loves me so much that he sent his son to die for me when I didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. We didn't deserve it. We've all sinned and come short. And so we learn that God loves us. God loves you no matter what. His love doesn't stop. Now, you can be rebellious, you can do all kinds of things and God still loves you. He still loves you. Now, he's not happy with what you're doing, but he still loves you. He doesn't give up on you. You know, in our human nature, you know, sometimes people do things and this and that and we kind of give up on them. Oh, that's it. I'm done. God's never done. He loves us. He loves us no matter what. No matter what we do. Now, he doesn't agree with sometimes what I do, and he doesn't condone what I do, but he still loves me. He still loves me. And I believe that's the way we fathers need to be. We love our children. You know the story of the prodigal son? You know, when the prodigal son left and went off and did his own thing and, you know, squandered everything his father had given him and he lived a horrible life and lived in sin, and he decided, well, I should go back to my father. The father was standing there waiting for him because he loved him. He didn't go, well, that stupid son of mine, I don't care if he ever comes back. Serves him right. Made all those decisions. Squandered my inheritance. Why, well, if he comes back, I'm going to make him pay. No. He stood there and loved his son. He loved him. And you know why that's hard for us? Because it's not our nature. The son who stayed there and, and did what he was supposed to and was obedient, he goes, what's going on? How's come you love him? You're giving him a party. You're treating him like, like a hero. See, he was upset. Because that's our sinful nature. Our sinful nature is, no, I'm going to make him pay. But God loves us. And no matter what, he stands there and he receives us. He receives us. No matter what. No matter what we've done, we, we can't do enough to ever get him to reject his love for us. He loves us. And I believe we need to be that way. We need to be that way 
with our family and our children. They, you know, they don't always do what we want. You don't condone it, but you still love them. You still love them. And God is compassionate. He's compassionate. Psalm 86, verse 15. But you, O Lord, are God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. God is full of compassion. He has pity on people. He shows concern. He shows understanding for people who are suffering. He has compassion on people who sin. You know, he, he may know what his word is, but he still has compassion. I don't think God's happy or, you know, like, oh boy, look at him sin. Isn't that wonderful? No, he has compassion. He has compassion on us. When someone's struggling, we should have compassion. We should have compassion on them. The Bible says we are to give extra help to the weaker vessel. The weaker vessel. In the animal world, the weaker one usually gets wiped out or killed. You know, or at least not, they just don't do well. But in God's kingdom, we give more honor to the weaker vessel. That's a real stretch for the church a lot of times. You know, to give honor to people who are struggling. Give honor to people who don't do things the way I do it. Give honor to people that don't live up to the standard that I have set. And so I believe that, you know, as, as a people of God, it's okay. We need to give honor and mercy and we need to give compassion. And we need to give mercy. We need to be merciful. In Ephesians, Ephesians, the second chapter. Ephesians, the second chapter, the fourth verse. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Mercy is given to those who have done something wrong. Give mercy. Have mercy. When we were dead in our sin, God showed mercy on us. He showed mercy. Mercy needs to be shown to others. We don't always show, have to show just, justice and punishment. This is a tough one because my next one is being just. How do you know when to be just and how do you know when to show mercy? I want to tell you something. There's no hard, fast rule. There's no hard, fast rule. I would hope and pray that as parents and as fathers, we would just know when it's okay to give mercy. That sometimes when our children have done things they shouldn't, what they need the most at that moment is mercy. It's not always punishment. And, and there's no hard, fast rule. I can't, I can't, I just know that there's times when you give mercy and there's times when there's punishment. I also know that as a parent, if I give mercy to my child, somebody watching is going to go, what are they letting them get away with that for? I've also known that people watching will say, well, how's come they get away with that? Sometimes in the church there's a double standard. There's a standard for new believers and there's a standard for people who are mature in Christ. And you can say, well, that's not fair. I'm just telling you, it's true. God, God knows where people are, and he knows what they need at that time. And it's not a hard, fast rule. If you want a hard, fast rule, you're going to struggle. Because there isn't one. You just go, you know what? I think my child at this moment needs mercy. Now, you still say, look, this was wrong. You know, you don't, it's not getting away with something, but it's just showing mercy. It's showing mercy. 
God shows mercy on us. Do you think we always get what we deserve from God? Wouldn't that be awful sometimes? If I got just exactly what I deserve for what I did? I'm thankful for God's mercy. I'm thankful he's rich in mercy. And sometimes we as parents need to be rich in mercy. You know, know when to show mercy. Know when to give mercy. Because God is just. He is just. He is just in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, starting at the third verse. For I proclaim the name of the Lord. Ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are just. A God of truth and without injustice. Righteousness and upright is he. God is just. He's right. He's true. You can depend on him. Sometimes as parents we need to be just. We need to say, no, this is it. This is what you need to do. I think one thing about justice, I think it's always consistent. You know, and I just said, well, sometimes you show mercy, sometimes you show justice. But I believe it's consistent. One of the worst things a parent can do is say, if you do that one more time, you're going to get it. Ten times later, if you do that one more time, you're going to get it. There's no justice. That's not even mercy. That's inconsistency. That's confusion. You know, it's like, and so the child thinks, well, I can do it because they never do nothing. And then all of a sudden you do something and it shocks them. Oh, how dare you do that? I didn't, think, I didn't think you'd do that. Well, we need to be just. We need to show mercy. We need to be consistent. We need to be consistent. One of the things about letting things go and, and wait until the 10th time, the downside is the 10th time you usually explode because you're just had it. It's been 10 times. I've told you 10 times not to do that. Now you're going to get it. Now I'm exploding. And that's wrong. That's wrong. We should consistently say, don't do that, and then carry out whatever's necessary so they don't do that. When you let it go, let it go, let it go. I don't know if you're ever in a classroom like that. You know, sometimes there was teachers like that. Man, they'd let, they'd let the class get away with murder. You know, they had no order. Everything's chaotic. Until that day, when that teacher exploded, everybody shocked. Oh my goodness, what happened? Well, they hit their limit. You know, now, that doesn't make for a nice classroom. That makes for inconsistency. Because you never know. I never know when they're going to explode. I don't think we discipline out of explosions. We discipline out of, because that's the rules. And that's how it's supposed to be. You know, we teach and train our children. We don't explode and then do all kinds of things. You know, we, want, we want always want things to be fair. But you know, fairness results in a momentary happiness. Justice teaches and makes life better. You know, the reason we want to be just is not so we can get them. We're not, it's not a game. We're not trying to get our children. We're not trying to catch them. And you know, we're trying to teach them. We're trying to train them. We train them. So we want to be just. We want to be fair. We want to be merciful. We want to be compassionate. Kind of all in one. Perfect? No. You're going to mess up. You know, we all do. I think one of the, one of the big things about looking back on, on raising children is thinking, oh man, I, I could have done that better. You know, right? Oh, I should have done this or I should have done that. There's always plenty of that. You know, there's always plenty of that. But I think in the midst of it, we need to think about being fathers. 
one of the things nowadays is you need to think about being a grandfather because grandfathers are raising a lot of children. So grandfathers are fathers. In a lot of situations, they're still, they're still fathers. And so I believe that it's important for us that we see God our Father. God is our example. You know, Lord, you know, I think it's a desire. Lord, I want to be a father like you. Now, I understand I will never be a father like you. That, you know, we're not God and we're not going to ever get there. But still, he's my example. And that's where I'm looking. And that's what I want to be like. And so to do that, you know, one of the things is I have to know God, my father. I have to know him. Not about him, but I have to know him. You know, sometimes we can know all about God, but that doesn't mean we know him. We have to receive him. In John, the first chapter, the 12th verse. For as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but were born of God. We have to receive him. We have to believe who he says he is. I believe he's my savior. Why do I believe he's my savior? Because I'm a sinner. And he's my savior because I need saved. Why do I need saved? It's because I'm a sinner. You know, I don't need a, I don't need a savior just because I just need one. I need it because I have a condition, and that is sin. And so God, my father, sent his son to pay the price for my sin so that I could be his child. I receive him. It says, so as many as received him, he gave them the right to become a child of God. The Bible calls it being born again. You know, we're born of the flesh. Born of the flesh doesn't make us children of God. We're born of the spirit makes us children of God. We're born again by the spirit of God. We become his children. We receive him. We receive him. Then he's my father. Then he's my father. And I'm his child. And then I can look to him. I can trust him. He can guide me. He can direct me. He can show me what he wants me to do. So I just encourage you. Encourage you. You know, number one, probably the most important thing is know your father. Know your heavenly father. Know him. Receive him. Look to him as the example. And then let, let him make us the fathers we need to be as we follow his examples. We look to him. And we trust him for all that we need. Um, we're going to hand out some gifts now. Jennifer, you want to go get the kids? See if they're about ready. We, uh, it's always interesting trying to coordinate things. And uh, so um, we're going to hand out some gifts of appreciation to the fathers. And... Uh, give you some things now what we're going to do is we're going to have the kids come and they're going to hand out gifts and then on the table on your way out are some goodies and uh, you can help yourself to one on the way out if you come and talk to me I might give you mine unless Mary's getting mine I haven't checked so anyway um, so you know it's it, but it's it's just you know Sometimes, you know, sometimes it feels like great responsibility. I think it is. I think it is a great responsibility being a father. But I think also we need to just realize that, you know, God wants to help us. And he'll help us to be what he wants us to be. Okay. Okay, kids, come on up front. Come on up here to me. Or if you got to get, why don't you get rid of your papers? You got somebody here to give your papers to? Why don't you give your papers to your dad? Your grandma and grandpa, Colton, you, hey, there you go. That way you can hold stuff better. Okay. All right. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to have all the, when I get ready, let's, we're going to have all the dads are going to stand up, okay? And when you see a dad standing up, then you give it to any dad, not just your dad. You can give it to your dad, too. But after you get done with your dad, then you got to go around and find a dad that's standing up, and you give him one of these presents, okay? 
Okay, and you, you hold on. Just well, here, why well, wait till I get them to stand up? When you and when you want to run out, come back and get some more because you can't quite make it all. Tell them uh, you got to go to your dad right away. Huh? <laughs> okay, dads, let's let's, let's stand up because I think we're we're ready to go. So, huh? Sure. Yes, you can. Yep. And all the dads stand up and yep, we got some absentee dads that are going to get one and whatever it takes here. Once you got yours, then you can sit down, and uh, that way the kids will know who's who's got them so far. Okay, there's you know, keep going. There's lots of them still standing. Okay, here Isaac, go this way over here. Okay, okay, go. There's 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 a big bunch of them back there. Go back and get those guys back over there. Tom's up on the stage. Okay, can you? Hey, Hey, I go up on the stage and give one to Tom. Okay, everybody got him. Everybody got one. Oh, he's a. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll get one for him. Okay, well they can go out and find him. Okay, yeah, take her out there. Oh, I'll give one to Brian. Right there. Okay. All right. You got any extras left? Oh, I got empty box. I'm glad nobody's standing. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe there's children with five or six in their pocket. I'm not sure. It don't matter. Okay. Okay. Let's all stand and we'll close with prayer. And don't forget to pick up these chairs and these up here and pick up your treat on the way out. So, Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this day. And we thank you for fathers. Lord, I pray you'd bless every father here. Lord, everyone who is a father to someone, Lord, that uh, you just bless them, encourage them, Lord. Encourage them to just uh, know you better so they can know how to be a father and a, and a grandfather and a friend to somebody. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, just send us forth with your blessing. Lord, help us to be faithful to you in all that we do. We just thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen.